Welcome to Exploring Black Holes. We're very pleased this evening to have Professor Alan Guth of MIT to speak to us about cosmological models. Professor Guth is an alumnus of MIT. He did both his undergraduate and graduate degrees here as a student in particle physics. He re-entered MIT after, re -entering the, after entering the subject of, of cosmology with his invention and, and discovery of the inflationary universe model. Having presented one model for the universe, Professor Guth will tonight present three in his talk, <laughs> The Universe and Three Examples. Uh, the reason for three examples, by the way, is that three sounds so much better than two. That, 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 the universe and two examples sounded so dumb. <laughs> so anyway, the, the main part of the talk will, in fact, be about two examples, namely the conventional Big Bang model without inflation and the inflationary model. Uh, but if we have time, at the end, just to be true to the title, uh, I will talk a little bit about the possibility of creating a universe in a laboratory. So a man-made universe or a woman-made universe uh, will be the third kind. Let's see if this works. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I want to begin by describing uh, the conventional Big Bang theory, uh, which really began with the work of, of Albert Einstein. Uh, Einstein invented his theory of general relativity in 1916 and then immediately set out to uh, try to figure out the consequences of general relativity for the universe. And he immediately discovered uh, that he ran into trouble when he tried to build the kind of model of the universe that he believed was the right one, namely a static model. Uh, throughout history, I guess, from at least going back to Newton, I guess, maybe the Greeks as well, uh, people had thought the universe was static. There was no evidence yet at this time that the universe was expanding. This was before Hubble's work. Uh, so Einstein made the same assumption as everybody else who looked up in the sky, stars seemed stationary, uh, decided we were living in a static universe. Uh, but when he applied his equations of, of gravity, he discovered something which at first surprised him, although later he realized it was really true in Newtonian mechanics as well. But uh, Newton had actually considered this question but had talked himself out of the right answer. Uh, the point is simply, though, that gravity is attractive. So if you try to build a model where point masses are suspended uniformly in space going all the way out to infinity, or a finite model, either way, uh, you have the problem that everything attracts everything else and it doesn't remain static, everything collapses. Uh, and Einstein found this to be an unavoidable consequence of the original form of his theory of general relativity. But he was still convinced the universe was static and he figured out a way to, uh, to modify it. Uh, and he introduced what he called the cosmological term, uh, which was an extra term in the equations that described how, in the Einstein field equations, the equation that described how gravitational fields are created by matter. And by adjusting the coefficient of this term, which he called the cosmological constant, to have just the right value, uh, he could create a repulsive force that would suspend the universe uh, against the collapse that it would otherwise undergo. And he was then able to succeed in constructing a, a static model of the universe. Now, all this disappeared, really, uh, in 1929 uh, with the discovery by Hubble uh, that the universe was, in fact, not static, but was expanding. Uh, it's probably a little unfair to give credit only to Hubble. Uh, Slipher, for example, had measured a redshift for a large number of galaxies before Hubble uh, got into it. But Hubble's the one who codified it, uh, who codified this expansion pattern into what we now know as Hubble's law, the statement that, on average, distant galaxies are receding from us uh, with a velocity which is equal to a number, which we call Hubble's constant, he didn't, um, times the distance to the galaxy. Now this number h is uh, not really a constant. Uh, I've always thought the astronomers call it a constant because it's essentially constant over the lifetime of an astronomer. Um, but it certainly changes as the universe evolves. Uh, this transparency is actually a little bit old. I think now we, we probably have a better idea of, of what it is than the somewhat large range 60 to 80, although I guess that's probably a two standard deviation estimate of the error or something like that. Uh, the best astronomical value comes from the uh, Hubble Space Telescope Key Project, which came up with a number of 72 plus or minus 8 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Uh, this number is now largely confirmed by uh, precise measurements of the cosmic background radiation, which can also be fit to the value of the Hubble constant and come up with numbers that are very much in the same range. 
Uh, once you discover that everything seems to be moving away from you, uh, it, it gives you something of the feeling of uh, a, a Ptolemaic universe where we're at the center and everything is moving radially outward from us. Uh, but as you're probably aware, that's not the way modern cosmologists look at the world. Uh, instead, there's a much simpler and more uniform explanation for H Hubble's law. How did that happen? <laughs> uh, and that is the idea of homogeneous expansion. Uh, what I've shown here uh, is an attempt to represent a part of the universe and three successive snapshots uh, where each snapshot is a photographic blow up uh, of the previous snapshot. And that's essentially how the universe expands. Uh, now, if you think about it, in a, in a photographic blow up, uh, all distances increase by the same percentage. So you can imagine yourself living on any one of the dots in this picture, which is supposed to represent galaxies in some crude way. Uh, and what you would see is you would see all the other galaxies moving away from you because all distances are increasing and you consider yourself to be at rest. And furthermore, you directly get out Hubble's law that the velocity is proportional to the distance uh, because all distances increase by the same percentage as you go from one picture to the next. And that means the bigger the original distance, the bigger the change in the distance in going from one picture to the next, hence the bigger the velocity. Uh, so this Hubble's law gives rise very naturally to this picture of a homogeneous expanding universe. Uh, the easiest way to describe such a universe, as you may have already discussed in this class, I don't know, is to introduce a scale factor. So you just pick one of these pictures and call that the map of the universe. Uh, and you put coordinates on it. And I've shown coordinates on all of them. The coordinates expand with the picture, which is what we have in mind. Uh, so you can just look at one picture, forget the others. They're all copies of each other anyway. Uh, and you could describe the expansion uh, just by changing the scale factor of the map. Uh, so you say that the physical distance is equal to a scale factor which changes with time times the number of notches that you'd measure on, an, on the map. Uh, and that way you can use one map and all of the expansion is taken care of just by the uh, scale factor. And that, of course, allows you to write simple equations to describe how that scale factor evolves. Uh, if one extrapolates this picture backwards, uh, one finds concludes immediately that the early universe must have been extraordinarily dense. And you know that when you compress a gas, it gets hotter. Uh, and that means that the early universe was much, much hotter than the present universe. And one can uh, infer that the gas that filled the early universe uh, was extraordinarily hot if you went back far enough. Uh, and if that's the case, you'd expect to see uh, some kind of a glow uh, of this hot matter from the early universe uh, surviving in the universe today. And uh, you know, back in the middle part of the 20th century, um, People were debating between the steady state model and the Big Bang model. Uh, and one of the predictions of the Big Bang model, although not everybody understood it at the time, uh, was that if the Big Bang was right, there should be a gas of radiation uh, filling today's universe. And that gas should, be, uh, should have a spectrum uh, representing a black body, uh, because the early universe would have been dense enough uh, that the radiation and the matter will, would have equilibrated, would have come to a uniform temperature. and Radiation at a uniform temperature is what we call black body radiation. It has a very distinctive spectrum. And what I've shown here is the first really accurate measure, measurement of the spectrum of the cosmic background radiation uh, from the COBE satellite. Uh, this data was released in 1990, very shortly after the satellite was actually launched. And the data itself is actually only based on nine minutes of running uh, of the satellite. Uh, and as you see, it's extraordinarily good. The data points have very, very small error bars and fit the theoretical curve uh, amazingly. Um, and this got much better still. Um, the satellite remained up in the air uh, taking data until, I don't know, 96, 97, something like that. 96, I suppose. Uh, and in 1996, uh, they released their, uh, what was probably, I guess, their final measurement of the spectrum. And the errors are reduced by a factor of 200 relative to this picture. Uh, and it still fit the black body curve essentially perfectly. So it really is amazing how accurately uh, this can be measured and how beautifully it fits uh, what you expect from this really very simple theory. Um, OK, let's say a few more words now about sort of how the standard Big Bang theory uh, works. Um, the theory basically says that the universe, uh, as we know it, uh, began some 10 to 15 billion years ago. And now, actually, we think we know this number even more accurately than that. It's now said to be 13.7 plus or minus 0.2 billion years. 
the qualification that I put in here, as we know it, uh, is uh, I think an important one. Um, the cosmologists have to cover their bets. Um, as you extrapolate the universe backwards, uh, the universe gets hotter and hotter and denser and denser, and you get to be further and further away from the kind of uh, situations in which you uh, really understand the laws of physics. Uh, so if you naively extrapolate this conventional Big Bang theory back to time zero, uh, you find a singularity at time zero, and before that you find nothing. Uh, space and time essentially began at, at time zero in the simplest mathematical form of the model. Uh, but there's not really any good reason to trust the extrapolation of the model back to such extraordinary early times. Uh, and there are, in fact, many other possibilities for what might have happened at t equals zero. Uh, and in fact, even inflation itself, I'll probably talk about later a little bit, uh, makes a rather different uh, statement about what probably happened at t equals zero. Uh, in inflationary models, it, it looks like uh, what we call the Big Bang was really just our local Big Bang, where local refers to something that's larger than the size of our visible universe, uh, but still small in the inflationary context to what we would think of as the size of the entire universe, which would be vastly larger uh, than what we can observe. Uh, the initial state uh, of this Big Bang was a hot, dense, uh, uniform soup of particles uh, that filled space uniformly. Um, you're probably aware already, so, but I'll say it anyway just in case. Uh, there's a common misconception about the Big Bang, uh, which is sort of popular in cartoons and in some popular science writing. Uh, namely, the idea that, uh, that the Big Bang was uh, uh, an egg of matter that existed in an empty space, and the egg exploded, spewing matter out to, to fill the empty space. Uh, that's not the way the Big Bang theory works at all. Uh, as far as I could tell, it's just as logical as, as the theory that we call the Big Bang. Um, but observationally, it doesn't work nearly as well, because um, if you did have an isolated explosion spewing matter out into empty space, then you would think that if you're out here someplace, uh, even if it was somewhat after the explosion, you expect to see something that looks somewhat different if you look toward the source of the explosion than if you looked in the opposite direction. Uh, but when we look around the universe, uh, what we see is that the universe looks essentially the same no matter what direction we look, uh, as long as you average over a big enough region, it's identical. And this, uh, this uniformity that we see is even most striking in the cosmic background radiation, which really is the earliest thing that we could see and what you'd expect to give us the best uh, description of, of the explosion itself. And that radiation is actually known to be uniform in all directions to an accuracy of, of one part in 100,000, uh, which is really an extraordinary amount of uniformity, which you would not expect if you had an isolated pocket of explosion here and we were out here looking at it. Uh, so it's a uniform explosion. From the beginning, you have to assume that uh, the matter filled the space. Now, the basic evidence for this Big Bang theory is Hubble's law, the fact that when we look out, we do see the universe expanding. We see all the galaxies, on average, moving away from us. And the further away they are, the faster we see them move. Uh, second important piece of evidence for the Big Bang theory uh, is the cosmic background radiation, the graph that I just showed you, showing this marvelous black body spectrum, uh, showing that, indeed, uh, the radiation looks just like what you expect uh, from the blow of hot matter in the early universe. I might mention something about the, the precision of that measurement and the implications of that. You might think that since thermal radiation is thermal, and things always thermalize eventually, um, that there might be a lot of different explanations for why we could have radiation that's thermal, that's filling the universe. Uh, but it isn't really true. Um, in order for gas to come to thermal equilibrium, it has to be in, in thermal contact with things. Uh, and the Radiation that's filling the universe now uh, is not really in thermal contact with anything. Uh, the universe is effectively empty as far as the radiation is concerned. The density of the universe is extremely low. Uh, so the fact that we're seeing such a perfect thermal spectrum does not merely mean that the universe has been around a while and has had reached thermal equilibrium. It really is a, a strong indication that the universe was at one time extremely dense, uh, nothing like what it is now. And I guess the sort of numbers that people put on that is that uh, the the degree to which the radiation resembles a, a black body really indicates that there could not have been, uh, that the universe really had to have thermalized in the first year of its existence. And since then, if anybody had put any kind of a bump in the spectrum, it would have survived. It would not have had time to, uh, to iron itself out. Uh, the other very important success of the Big Bang Theory uh, is the uh, synthesis of the light chemical elements. 
the important point here is that the early universe was so hot uh, that even the nuclei of atoms uh, would not have been stable. They would have just been ripped apart by the thermal energy. Uh, so the fact that we see nuclei in the universe today uh, implies that those nuclei must have formed after the Big Bang, uh, if, if the theory is right at all. Uh, now, the theory really is quantitative. Uh, it's not just a cartoon image of an explosion. Um, it, it's even not even all that difficult to calculate how fast the universe would have been expanding at any given time, uh, what the temperature would have been at any given time, what the density would have been at any given time, and so on. Uh, it really is just a calculation involving the expansion of a gas in thermal equilibrium being retarded by the pull of gravity. And you can even do it by Newtonian methods and you get essentially the right answer. Uh, so with this quantitative picture of how the universe expanded and cooled, uh, one can combine that with what we know about nuclear physics and actually calculate the rates of nuclear reactions that would have happened in the early universe. And that means that it's possible to calculate the expected abundances uh, of the different nuclei. Uh, this story has a peculiar history uh, because the idea of doing these calculations really began back in the 1940s with George Gamow and his collaborators. And they pursued these calculations for a while and then became very frustrated because they could not find any way to synthesize uh, any significant amount of nuclei heavier than lithium. Uh, so they gave up in, in disgust. Uh, but in fact, we now think they were entirely right. Uh, the elements heavier than lithium, we now believe, were not produced in the Big Bang, uh, but were produced much later in the history of the universe in the interior of stars. Uh, and then when stars explode, they spew these heavier elements uh, out into space, are uh, ready to recollect into later generation stars like our sun. So essentially all the stuff that we're made out of, which is all, all, almost all heavier than lithium, um, is material that was synthesized in some other star. Uh, but nonetheless, the lightest chemical elements, uh, which make up about 98% of the baryonic matter in the universe, even though there's only a few of them, uh, were produced primarily in the Big Bang. And the Big Bang theory allows us to calculate the expected abundances of those nuclei. And it really works very well uh, and provides a rather remarkable test of the Big Bang theory. Uh, the other thing that's remarkable about this nucleosynthesis calculations uh, is that the processes that produced these light chemical elements uh, began about one second after the Big Bang. So even in the 1960s and 70s, the cosmologists were exploring the history of the universe all the way back to one second after the Big Bang. And they had real observational tests uh, of what they were talking about. And now we're trying to go back even further. Uh, despite these big successes, let's see, hold on, I didn't get to the bottom of that transparency. Just push the button by mistake. Uh, okay, uh, so the Big Bang Theory can describe how the early universe expanded and cooled. It can describe how the light chemical elements formed, as we just discussed. Uh, and it does also give us a, at least a, a, a framework uh, for describing how the matter congealed to form stars and galaxies and clusters of galaxies and so on. Uh, this, of course, as you might guess, is a very complicated story and people are still working on it. Uh, but certainly our general picture uh, that matter collected through the force of gravity uh, seems to be holding up very, very well. Uh, in spite of these big successes of the conventional Big Bang Theory, there are certain topics uh, which the Big Bang Theory really just says nothing about. Uh, in particular, in spite of the fact that for over 50 years now it's been called the Big Bang Theory, uh, the one thing that it really says essentially nothing about is, is the Big Bang itself. Uh, the, what, what, what cosmologists call the Big Bang Theory uh, really is very strictly uh, only a theory of the aftermath of some kind of a bang. Uh, the bang happened before the theory starts. Uh, so when the theory starts, all the matter is already in place. It's already expanding uniformly. And all the Big Bang Theory describes is how that expansion was slowed by the force of gravity and how it continued through the force of inertia. Uh, but the Big Bang Theory says nothing about what caused the explosion. Uh, it says nothing about what banged, why it banged, or what happened before it banged. Um, and it also says nothing about where all this matter came from. Uh, in the conventional Big Bang Theory, all of the matter that's, I mean, for every particle that's in the universe today, uh, there was some precursor particle uh, that was there right at the beginning when the theory started to describe nature. Uh, so no explanation whatever of where the matter may have come from. Uh, inflation. Uh, 
offers a possible explanation uh, to each of those two questions, where the matter came from and what started it expanding. Uh, the secret behind inflation uh, is the realization that modern particle theories uh, actually predict that at very high energies, uh, we should expect to find forms of matter uh, which literally turn gravity on its head and cause gravity to become repulsive. Uh, the way this works uh, is that, as you probably have learned, in general relativity, it's not just matter or energy that can create a gravitational field. It's the whole, what is often called the energy momentum tensor that contributes to the source of gravity. And in particular, that includes pressures. Uh, so pressures can affect uh, gravitational fields. Pressures can create gravitational fields. Uh, and the, it works more or less the way you probably naively guess. Uh, the kinds of pressures we're familiar with are positive pressures, uh, and the kind of gravity we're familiar with is attractive gravity. So you might guess that positive pressures would cause attractive gravity, and that's right. Uh, the pressures don't have to be positive. Uh, there are forms of matter that have negative pressures, uh, and that's what I'm talking about here. If the pressure is sufficiently negative, it can create more repulsive gravity than the mass density associated with that material uh, creates attractive gravity. Uh, so you can have net repulsion. Uh, and that is the secret behind inflation. Um, so the inflationary theory proposes that at least a small patch of this, oh, I see, I'm seeing the thing in the bottom, that's what's doing it. Uh, inflation proposes that there's at least a patch uh, of the early universe, not necessarily all of it, uh, that was filled with this very peculiar repulsive gravity kind of material. Uh, and that patch does not have to be very large at all. Uh, if we assume, although we don't know for sure, that inflation happened at the energy scale associated with what particle physicists call grand unified theories, uh, then we can make estimates of the numbers that go with some of these concepts. Uh, and the patch would only have to be uh, about a billion times smaller than the size of a single proton to be big enough to start inflation happening. And once inflation happens, uh, the result is that the region that's inflating um, starts to grow exponentially. Uh, and it grows exponentially with an extremely short time constant. Again, taking numbers typical of grand unified theories, uh, the time constant of the exponential expansion uh, would be as short as about 10 to the minus 37 seconds, uh, which of course is an unbelievably small number. Uh, these numbers that I'm using, which I'm attributing to grand unified theories, maybe I should take out a minute here to say something about where, where grand unified theories get these crazy numbers from. Um, the idea that underlies the grand unified theories is the idea that the three kinds of interactions that we observe in nature other than gravity, namely the weak interactions, the strong interactions, and electromagnetic interactions, are all really different manifestations of the same underlying force law. Uh, but at low energies, the energies that we exist at, low by the standards of quantum particle physics, uh, these three interactions behave very differently. Uh, electromagnetic interactions are much stronger than weak interactions. Strong interactions are much stronger than electromagnetic interactions. Um, so it doesn't look at all like these can really be just different aspects of the same force. But within the standard model of particle physics, you can calculate how the strengths of these interactions uh, vary with energy. And you can extrapolate upward. And what you discover is that if you extrapolate upward to an energy of about 10 to the 16th GeV, billion electron volts, uh, in other words, 10 to the 16th times the mass of a proton, uh, all three of these interactions have the same strength. Uh, and that is the underlying uh, principle behind grand unified theories. The idea is that there's a fundamental interaction which at the energy scale of 10 to the 16th GeV uh, would look like it was just one kind of interaction with the weak, strong, and electromagnetic interactions all being the same. Uh, if that were the case, by the way, uh, quarks, electrons, and neutrinos would all look the same also. Uh, but at that energy scale, there is uh, something that happens that we call spontaneous symmetry breaking, which causes the different kinds of interactions to appear different at lower energies. Uh, but that's what determines this extraordinarily high energy scale of grand unified theories. It's a question of just where the strengths of the interactions meet when you extrapolate upward. Uh, and that's what gives all these crazy numbers associated with inflation. 
Uh, inflation, by the way, though, does not really care much about grand unified theories. Inflation could happen at a significantly lower scale, uh, but nonetheless, it would still have to be higher than anything that we're accustomed to. It would have to be at least the scale of, say, the, what we call the electroweak scale, 1,000 GeV. Um, the only thing that sets the lower bound for the energy that, uh, scale that inflation can happen at uh, is the fact that at the end of inflation, one has to be able to produce the baryons that we see in the universe today. And one doesn't know any way to do that except at pretty high energies. So continuing with the story, sorry for the aside, I hope I didn't confuse you. Uh, back to the story, we, ha we're now, we now have this small region that's undergoing exponential expansion uh, with a time constant of 10 to the minus 37 seconds. Uh, now we come to the first very, very surprising fact. I guess repulsive gravity is maybe the first surprising fact. Now surprising fact number two is that this peculiar material has the unusual feature that unlike any normal stuff that we know of, which would thin out as it expands, uh, this repulsive gravity material actually maintains a completely constant density uh, as it expands. So it really is essentially creating new energy uh, as the expansion takes place. Uh, now, new energy doesn't sound very consistent with all that we've learned about conservation of energy all these years. Uh, it is consistent. Uh, maybe I didn't. Maybe it's a bit wrong to call it new energy. Um, so the process that's going on here is completely consistent with con conservation of energy, uh, but it takes advantage of, of a, at least what before inflation was a fairly little known loophole in the principle of conservation of energy. Uh, namely, we're usually accustomed to thinking of energies as always being positive. And if energies are always positive, and you look around the world and see that it has lots and lots of energy, uh, the only way that energy could have gotten here, if it's conserved, is if it was here from the start. Um, but energies are not always positive, and in fact, uh, the energy density of a gravitational field uh, is not positive, but negative. Uh, and that means that as the expansion of this region is going on, and more and more energy is appearing in the form of this peculiar material that fills the region, uh, that energy is positive. Uh, at the same time, more and more negative energy is appearing in the form of the gravitational field that's filling this region. So total energy is conserved. Uh, the humongous creation of positive energy is compensated by the humongous creation of negative energy in the form of the gravitational field. So the total energy remains constant, therefore remains entire, incredibly small, because it all started out a billion times smaller than a proton. Uh, and the energy could very well be exactly zero, uh, with a perfect cancellation of the energy of matter uh, on the positive side and the energy of gravitational fields uh, on the negative side. Uh, I think I'll come back to the rest of this transparency if I have them in the right order. I think, yeah, the next transparency has a little thought experiment uh, to try to convince you that, indeed, gravitational energy really is negative. Uh, it's a Newtonian experiment. Um, but the same thing, well, the same thing is true in general relativity. And I guess maybe one doesn't have to think of it as a Newtonian experiment. It's a, it's a, I guess the same results would, would happen in general relativity pretty much. Uh, what I want you to think about here on the top part of the slide, uh, we show a hollow shell of matter. And these arrows show the gravitational field of that matter, uh, shown as conventional field lines with it density of the field lines is related to the strength of the field. And as you hopefully know, uh, if we have a shell of matter, uh, the gravitational insi field inside is exactly zero. Uh, it's canceled from poles in different directions. Uh, and the gravitational field outside uh, is exactly the same as what you'd have if you just had a point mass of the same total mass located at the center. And all this was really discovered by Isaac Newton way back when. OK, now for the thought part of the thought experiment. I want to imagine letting this shell of matter collapse. I want to imagine it's made out of something soft, like soft clay. Uh, so it's not rigid. And it's, every bit of it is pulling on the rest. So there'll be a gravitational force pulling inward uh, everywhere on the shell. And I want to take advantage of that force to generate power. Uh, so these little things attached to it are supposed to be little bicycle generators, uh, like uh, you have a generator light. Uh, and I, I'm imagining tying a string around each of the generators so that as the shell of matter pulls inward, uh, it pulls on all the strings, turns all the generators, lights a lot of lights. Uh, then on the third transparency, uh, the third little image at the bottom, uh, it, we think about what 
what the net exchanges of energy were during this process. And the diagram is supposed to show space in, th in three different regions. Uh, outside the region where the gravitational field, where the shell originally was, this circle is supposed to be the same radius as that circle. Uh, outside of that region, the gravitational field is exactly the same as it was at the beginning. Uh, it's just the gravitational field of a point mass uh, located at the origin. Uh, at the very center, the gravitational field is zero, just like it was in the original picture. So the change from the original picture to this picture is the region in between, the region of space that the shell moved through as it collapsed. And that region is now filled with the gravitational field, uh, while previously there was no gravitational field there at all. And that's the only change between in the gravitational field between picture one and picture three, A and C, as they're labeled on the transparency. Uh, so the net effect of this operation was to extract energy uh, and create more gravitational field. So if energy is conserved, there's only one possible conclusion. Uh, the gravitational field must contain negative energy to cancel the positive energy that was given off, so that the total energy at the end is the same as the total energy at the beginning. Um, so I think there's no doubt from thought experiments like this or from other calculations uh, that the energy of the gravitational field is, is certainly negative. Uh, I might mention that if you're familiar with how to calculate the gravitational field of a Coulomb field, excuse me, if you're familiar with how to calculate the energy density of a Coulomb field, <laughs> um, then you could probably pretty immediately realize that it's the same for Newton's law of gravity uh, as it is for Coulomb interactions. They're both 1 over r squared force laws. Uh, but there is one important difference, which is the overall sign. Uh, if I have two positive charges, they repel each other. If I have two positive masses, they attract each other. Uh, you calculate the energy in a field by asking how much work do you have to do to push around the sources of that field to create the field. Uh, if you imagine doing that for masses and doing it for charges, uh, it's exactly the same calculation, uh, but you have to push charges together to create a strong electric field. So the electric field has a lot of energy in it. You have to put energy in it to make it. Uh, while at the same time, if you're trying to make a strong gravitational field by putting masses together, you actually take energy out as you put the masses together. Uh, so the energy of the gravitational field is negative. Okay, back to where I was. Um, so we have this region of space undergoing exponential expansion at essentially uniform density. Uh, and we have to get out of that somehow. We don't want to keep doing that forever because that's not what our universe looks like now. Uh, but that turns out to be natural too because this repulsive gravity material that I was talking about with the negative pressure is unstable. Uh, so it decays, um, and it decays very much like a radioactive substance. It has a half-life, essentially. Um, and when it decays, it, like a radioactive substance, it doesn't disappear when it decays. It means it turns into other kinds of materials and releases energy in the process. Uh, so it converts to ordinary matter uh, with extra energy. So the matter heats up. This is often called reheating. Uh, and what you're left with is a hot, hot gas of ordinary particles after inflation. Uh, and that, turns, that, of course, is just what you want, because it's essentially reproducing the uh, starting point of the conventional Big Bang theory. Uh, it doesn't have to go very long to succeed in creating everything that we see. Uh, it turns out that it only takes about 100 e-foldings uh, of this exponential expansion uh, to go from something a, a more than a billion times smaller than the size of a proton to something which, at the end of inflation, would be about, be about the size of a marble which sounds awfully small, but at these extraordinary densities, that in fact is the nascent form of our universe. It continues expanding, coasting uh, for another 14 billion years and becomes large enough to encompass everything that we see. Uh, so the bottom line then is that uh, inflation does nothing to change the Big Bang Theory. The entire Big Bang Theory gets kept intact, uh, but inflation serves the very nice purpose of uh, setting up the initial conditions uh, which previously just had to be assumed. OK, well, so far, I imagine uh, I've got across, gotten across the point that, that inflation is sort of a nice story about how the universe might have been created. Uh, uh, on this transparency and the next, I'd like to say a few words about uh, why we think it's actually pretty likely that our universe uh, actually did undergo inflation in its early period. Uh, so I want to talk about some of the signs that our universe has, some of the traits that it has uh, that seem to point towards an inflationary beginning. 
Uh, and there are three of them I want to talk about, two on this transparency and one on the next. Uh, so the first is the, the large-scale uniformity. Uh, I think I mentioned earlier uh, that the uh, that when we look at the cosmic background radiation, uh, it appears to be essentially uniform in all directions to this extraordinary accuracy uh, of one part in 100,000. Uh, now, if we ask what that says about the early universe, uh, we have to ask a little bit about what the history of this cosmic background radiation was. Uh, it has a fairly simple history. Uh, during the first approximately three or 400,000 years of the history of the universe, uh, according to our calculations, the universe was sufficiently hot uh, that the gas in the universe would have been ionized. And it turns out that photons have a very short mean free path when they're going through a plasma, an ionized gas. Uh, the free electrons of the plasma have a very large cross-section for scattering the electrons. Uh, so during the first three or 400,000 years of the history of the universe, uh, the photons were at every given instant moving at the speed of light, uh, but nonetheless they didn't go anywhere because they were constantly being scattered in different directions. So they were doing a, a random walk with a very short step size. Uh, and the net result was essentially no, no transportation during that, that first time period. But then at about three or 400,000 years after the Big Bang, the universe cooled enough so that the gas neutralized. It became a neutral gas like the air in this room. And it's not always safe to extrapolate from the room to the universe. Uh, but this particular extrapolation actually works. That is, just like the air in the universe is transparent to photons, it turns out that since 400,000 years after the Big Bang, the gas that fills the universe has been transparent to photons. Uh, and that means that the photons that we observe in the cosmic background radiation today uh, have, for the most part, been traveling on straight lines uh, since 400,000 years after the Big Bang. Now, just like when photons travel from my face to your eyes, they allow your eyes to form an image of what my face looks like, uh, we are actually seeing, when we look at the cosmic background radiation, an image of what the universe looked like uh, at three or 400,000 years after the Big Bang. Uh, so since the radiation is so incredibly uniform, uh, that implies that the universe itself must have been incredibly uniform, one part in 100,000, uh, at this very, very early time. Now, we know that things tend to come to a uniform temperature. Uh, so it's a fair question to ask, could the universe have come to this uniform temperature uh, just because things always come to the uniform temperature. You take a slice of pizza out of the oven and it cools down to the temperature of the room. Uh, but you can ask, was there enough time for that? And you might at first think you have to figure out about thermal coefficients and things like that. Uh, it turns out to be much easier. It's just a simple kinematics problem. Uh, a simple calculation shows that for the universe to even itself out by such an early time, if it did not start out uniform, uh, it would require that energy and information could be transmitted across the universe uh, at a speed that would have to be about 100 times the speed of light. Okay, if the universe started out non-uniform, you'd have to be able to get energy from one end of the visible universe to the other by 300,000 years after the Big Bang. And you can't. You miss by a factor of about 100. Uh, so we do think that nothing travels faster than light. And that means that within this conventional Big Bang theory, uh, there simply was not enough time for the universe to smooth itself out. And the only way you can make the conventional Big Bang theory work is to just assume that the universe started out completely uniform for reasons unexplained. Uh, inflation has a very nice way of, of getting around this problem uh, because with inflation, uh, one has this spurt of accelerated expansion. And what that spurt of accelerated expansion allows you to do is to start with a model of the universe which was far, far smaller uh, than you ever could have imagined in conventional cosmology. Uh, and that means that this speck that existed before inflation started uh, was small enough so it could have easily reached a uniform temperature and uniform density by the same kind of mundane processes by which the air in the room spreads itself out uniformly and comes to a uniform temperature. Uh, and then after that uniformity is established, inflation can take over and stretch that tiny region uh, to become large enough to include everything that we see. So inflation gives a very natural explanation uh, for how the universe got to be so amazingly uniform. And it really is an amazingly uniform universe uh, that we're living in. Uh, by the way, it's perfectly okay with me if you want to ask questions during the talk. Uh, I think that that would be fine. Any questions? Yeah? Did particle creation occurred after inflation was over as well? Um, 
Well, I guess what I should have said is that after inflation is over, this uh, conversion of gravitational energy into matter energy has ended. Uh, but one still has the conversion of energy from one kind of particle to another. Uh, so the particles that are associated with the this repulsive gravity material that I'm talking about um, can decay into other kinds of particles, which then still decay into other kinds of particles. So it has ordinary particle interactions going on after inflation. And gradually, uh, rather actually rather quickly, uh, we believe that the matter in the universe uh, reached a kind of a thermal equilibrium uh, where every particle was uh, had an abundance that was pretty much determined by the energy necessary to produce that particle. Any other questions? Where did this spec come from? <laughs> ah! <laughs> Any other easy questions? <laughs> um, well, of course, we don't know. Um, there are speculations, however, uh, which you know, are worth talking about. Um, you know, I think you know, some years ago, the idea of, of actually creating a universe by scientific processes probably sounded completely absurd. Uh, now it sounds at least sensible enough so that uh, respect respectable journals do publish papers on the subject. Um, the, uh, the sort of class of ideas that I think are, are most prevalent in, in physics literature uh, and in thinking of most cosmologists are ideas that combine uh, notions from quantum gravity, uh, well, notions from quantum theory with notions of gravity, therefore quantum gravity. Uh, we don't really have a very successful quantum theory of gravity yet. Uh, string theory is supposed to be, a, in principle, a successful quantum theory of gravity. And my guess is that it probably is. Uh, but people still don't, don't understand string theory very well. So really, for all of the, for almost all of the questions uh, that people have been hoping would be answered by quantum gravity, the string theorists still don't have any, anything to say about it. In particular, they don't really have anything to say about the creation of the universe yet. Uh, but the vague ideas that people have had have uh, centered from the idea that, um, that in the quantum theory, everything is probabilistic. You can always undergo quantum jumps from any state to any other state if they have the same values of conserved quantities. It's essential for all this, by the way, that we believe that all of the conserved quantities of the universe are zero, uh, which may seem surprising at first. But if you think about it, it's, it's probably true. Um, the, the, the subtle ones are energy. Uh, and you know, years ago, people thought the universe had a tremendous amount of energy, so it, and, and that energy is conserved. But now, now, now people realize that gravity has negative energy, and the total energy of the universe is very likely zero. Uh, another conservation law that's uh, subtle in its implications is conservation of baryon number, uh, the number of protons plus neutrons minus the number of antiprotons minus the number of antineutrons. And there are other particles that contribute to that list. Uh, that are more short-lived. Uh, that, that number is experimentally conserved. And in the 1960s, when I was in graduate school, uh, that was considered a firm conservation law of nature, the conservation of baryon number. And it's certainly as well confirmed experimentally as any conservation law we know of, I think. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, starting really in the 70s and 80s, uh, physicists realized that uh, conservation of baryon number almost certainly is not an exact conservation law of nature. Um, the first glitch that people discovered uh, was that when one tried to build these grand unified theories that I spoke about, uh, the grand unified theories never conserved baryon number. Uh, but we're still consistent with observation uh, because their most novel predictions occur at these extraordinarily high energy scales. Uh, they're still consistent with the idea that low energies uh, baryon number seems to be very accurately conserved, even though at very high energies, baryon number would be very, very badly violated by grand unified theories. Uh, it was then later discovered that there are, in fact, subtleties associated with the quantization of what we call the standard model of particle physics, which is much better confirmed and much, uh, much more mundane than grand unified theories. Uh, so now physicists are, are well convinced on theoretical grounds that even the standard model of particle physics does not exactly conserve baryon number, even though the violations are, again, extremely small unless you go to very high energies. Uh, so the, the picture now is that baryon number is not believed to be conserved. And it's believed that at high energies, it can be uh, violated quite badly. 
And we believe that the excess of baryons over antibaryons that you see in our universe uh, was the result of baryon non-conserving processes in the early universe. Uh, so that the fact that the universe appears to have a net baryon number is, again, not, not a statement that we have a conserved quantum number uh, that the universe has a non-zero value for. Uh, other conserved quantities you can think about, charge, uh, as far as we can tell, the universe is perfectly consistent with having zero electric charge. Uh, angular momentum, uh, as far as we can tell, the universe is perfectly consistent with having zero angular momentum. Uh, so it really does look like we have a, a zero quantum number universe. So if that's the case, coming back to how you might create a universe from nothing, uh, you could then imagine that in the full quantum theory of general relativity, uh, there would be a, a quantum state that corresponds to nothingness. Uh, the absence of space, absence of time, absence of everything. Uh, and if geometry is described by this theory, uh, then you know, for every possible geometry, there's a state in the theory. And one possible geometry is the geometry of no points, uh, the geometry of nothingness. Uh, so if that's the case, then you can imagine a, a quantum jump from nothingness to somethingness. Uh, and of course, you only need to make a very small universe by this quantum jump, because then inflation can take over and turn it into a big universe. Um, so I think there's a very valid line of speculation there. Uh, we certainly don't yet have uh, a quantitative theory or any general agreement about, about how such a quantitative theory might work. I'm also unclear as to why uh, you said when it got to about the size of a marble, why the expansion would have quit being exponential. Would you repeat the question? Uh, yeah, the question was uh, that the, the questioner wasn't clear why, when the universe reached the size of about a marble, that the uh, expansion would no longer be accelerating. Um, the, well, let's see, first of all, I should maybe specify that uh, it doesn't have to stop when it, reach, when it reaches marble size. Uh, what I meant to say, but probably wasn't quite as precise as I should have been, is that at the end of inflation, uh, the region that will evolve to become the presently observed universe was about the size of a marble. So the actual thing could have been much bigger. So if it expands well beyond marble size and then expansion stops, the acceleration stops, that's fine. There's, there's no need for any fine tuning here. You just need to have enough inflation. Now what causes it to stop is the fact that this repulsive gravity material that I'm talking about is fundamentally unstable. Uh, so it's a metastable state uh, and with some finite lifetime. Uh, so eventually it will decay. And, uh, the detailed particle physics of this repulsive gravity material is not actually something that we know about. Um, uh, you know, a typical theory gives rise to such materials, but the detailed properties of those materials can vary from theory to theory. Okay, I'll go on, but feel free to interrupt any time. Um, so item two on my list, uh, in terms of pieces of evidence that our actual universe very likely underwent inflation uh, is what's called the flatness problem, uh, which is related to the mass density of the universe and the geometry of the universe. Uh, cosmologists always talk about the mass density of the universe in terms of a ratio called capital Greek omega, uh, which is the actual mass density divided by a number called the critical density. And this critical density is determined uh, by the geometry of the universe. Uh, the universe is expanding, as we've already said. And this critical density will depend on that expansion rate. Uh, but according to general relativity, space bends. It bends uh, in response to the matter that fills the space. And homogeneous universes are actually the most simple example, really, of the consequences of general relativity. Uh, if the mass density exceeds a certain critical value, uh, the universe will curve back on itself, forming what's called a closed universe. Uh, this closed universe uh, really is a very good analog of the surface of a sphere surface of a sphere is two-dimensional. The space of our universe is three-dimensional. But otherwise, uh, the properties of a closed universe are essentially identical to the properties of the surface of a sphere. Um, on the surface of a sphere, first of all, the total area of the surface of a sphere is finite. Similarly, the total volume of a closed universe would be finite. If you travel on the surface of a sphere, you never encounter any edge. You just go around and around and around. Same with the closed universe. You never encounter any edge to a closed universe. If you keep traveling in what you thought was a straight line, you come back to where you started from and go around and around and around. Uh, in both cases, the axioms of Euclidean geometry are violated. Uh, for example, if you follow two parallel lines on the surface of a sphere, uh, 
red and starting at the equator following two uh, longitude lines upward. Those longitude lines will meet when you get to the North Pole. Uh, so lines that look parallel on the surface of a sphere will eventually meet. Uh, same thing in a closed universe. Lines which look parallel, if you extend them far enough, will converge. Uh, another feature of standard feature of Euclidean geometry is the sum of the angles of a triangle. Uh, according to Euclidean geometry, it's always 180 degrees. Uh, but if you draw a triangle on the surface of a sphere, you could probably see it sort of bulges outward, and the total of the angles is always a little more than 180 degrees, depending on how big the triangle is. And same thing in a closed universe. Uh, if you look at a triangle in a closed universe, the sum of the three angles is always a little bit more than 180 degrees. Now, if the mass density is just a little bit less than this critical density, um, then you have what's called an open universe. Uh, and in open universe, all the properties are exactly the opposite of what we just said. So the space is not finite, it's infinite. Uh, if you follow two parallel lines in an open universe, they will start to diverge. Uh, if you look at a triangle in an open universe, the sum of the angles will always be a little bit less than 180 degrees. And if the mass density is just right, you get Euclidean geometry, and that's called the, that's the critical density. It's that precise density which gives you Euclidean geometry instead of an open or a closed universe. Now, uh, to, uh, to appreciate the story, I'd like to go a little bit back in time to say five years ago or 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Uh, at, at those times, any one of them, you can take your pick, uh, the best we knew about omega was that it was equal to 1 to within about a factor of 10. During most of that time, people thought omega was somewhere between 1 tenth to 3 tenths. Of, of the, oh, this means the mass density was 1 tenth or 3 tenths. Uh, of, the, of the critical density. Now it turned out that turns out that even if that's all you know, uh, it's already incredibly shocking that it's so close to one, even though one tenth doesn't sound all that close to one. It sounds like it's off by a factor of ten, which usually isn't that close. Uh, but the reason why a factor of ten is close in this case uh, is you, you see by extrapolating backwards the numbers that I'm quoting are numbers or estimates for the present universe. Uh, if you look at the evolution of omega. It turns out that omega and the number one um, evolve in a way that's uh, a close analog of a pencil balanced on its tip. Uh, if a pencil is perfectly balanced on its sharp tip, uh, it won't know which way to fall and will stay there forever if you don't have any wind and you're using classical mechanics to describe it. Uh, but as soon as the pencil leans just a tiny bit in any direction, it will rapidly start to fall in that direction. Uh, same thing with omega and one. It's an unstable, omega equals one is an unstable equilibrium point. And what that means is that if omega in the early universe were just a tiny bit less than 1, it would have rapidly fallen off to 0. And if omega in the early universe were just a tiny bit more than 1, it would have rapidly risen up towards infinity. Um, so the fact that omega is anywhere near today, which is pretty late in the history of the universe, and, uh, indicates that at early times, omega must have been extraordinarily close to 1. Uh, so in particular, plugging in numbers, uh, at one second after the Big Bang, even if all you knew was that omega was within a factor of 10 of being 1 today, you would still know that at one second after the Big Bang, uh, omega must have been 1 to 15 decimal places. Uh, so I always like to say that the value of the mass density of the universe at one second after the Big Bang is actually the, the best known number in physics. Uh, and it gets even worse if you try to extrapolate back earlier. If you go back to the Planck time, 10 to the minus 43 seconds, which is the time at which we think the quantum effects of gravity become important, uh, at that time, omega, if we just extrapolate this conventional model, omega must have been equal to 1 to 58 decimal places, uh, which is absolutely, of course, absurd. Um, inflation gets around that. And the way that inflation gets around that is it reverses the evolution of omega dramatically. Uh, inflation turns gravity on its head and causes it to become repulsive. And that also changes the way omega evolves. Uh, so instead of omega being driven uh, away from 1, uh, during inflation, omega is driven sharply towards 1. Uh, so with inflation, you could start out with omega being 10 or 1 tenth or a million or a million. Um, and inflation will drive omega to 1 uh, to the extraordinary accuracy that you need. Uh, it drives omega to 1 exponentially. And in fact, the exponential has half the time constant of the exponential of the expansion. So it drives it twice as strongly to, towards 1 as, as the space expands. Uh, so inflation gives a very natural explanation of uh, of why you expect omega to be so close to 1. And in fact, this has always been considered a prediction of inflation. Uh, this mechanism that drives omega towards 1 drives omega towards 1 a lot. 
So unless inflation really just ends it just as omega finally gets near one, which doesn't seem very plausible at all, uh, you end up with inflation driving omega exactly to one, or essentially exactly to one. Uh, so the expectation in the inflationary model is that today omega really should be absolutely indistinguishable from one. And for most of the uh, 20 some year, 23 year, I guess, history uh, of inflation, that was a very bad prediction. And people thought that inflation maybe wasn't exactly right because it was predicting a omega one, and that's not what anybody saw. Uh, but with just within the past few years, uh, mainly with the advent of what we now call dark energy, it now looks like omega really is one. And in fact, according to the uh, results of the WMAP satellite, which I'll show you in a few minutes, uh, omega is now supposed to be equal to 1.02 plus or minus 0.02. Uh, so to within 2% or so, uh, we now think we actually have evidence, observational evidence, uh, that omega really is equal to one, just like inflation predicts. Okay, and that actually brings me to the next point. Um, while inflation explains why the universe is so uniform when you average over very large regions, uh, inflation also provides an understanding of the non-uniformities that we see on very small scales. The non-uniformity is responsible for galaxies and clusters of galaxies, and also for faint ripples that can be seen in the cosmic background radiation. And those faint ripples are one of the easiest ways of making precise comparisons between theory and observation, because the ripples are so faint that you can use linear perturbation theory to calculate them. Well, if you talk about galaxies, it gets very complicated to calculate, so it's very hard to compare what you see uh, with what would be predicted by a theory about the early universe. Um, so astronomers have now made very accurate measurements of these non-uniformities. Uh, they arise inflation in, in inflationary models in a very peculiar way. Uh, they depend crucially on quantum theory. Uh, classically, inflation would just smooth everything out by this enormous expansion. Uh, but quantum mechanically, uh, everything is probabilistic. So if classically it's uniform, in a quantum mechanical version of that, it would mean that in some places, just by quantum mechanical chance, the density would end up being a little bit higher than this classical average. In other places, it would be a little bit lower than the classical average. Uh, so inflation leads very naturally to an almost uniform background with small ripples. And you can predict the pattern of those ripples using quantum theory and understanding. It's mainly a question of understanding how inflation ends. Uh, the main effect is that because of quantum uncertainties, inflation doesn't end at exactly the same time everywhere. Some places inflate a little bit more, and some places inflate a little bit less. And that ends up producing non-uniformities in the mass density. Now, we, it turns out that we don't know enough about the particle physics of very high energies to be able to predict the amplitude of these fluctuations, the, the intensity of these ripples. Uh, so we have to take that from the data. And inflation right now, if we knew the full particle physics, inflation would, would predict what that should be. But since we don't know the full particle physics, inflation does not give us a prediction for the intensity of ripples. Uh, but inflation does give us a prediction for the spectrum of the ripples. That is, how the intensity of the ripples should vary with the wavelength of the different ripples. Uh, you should think wavelength here and not frequency when I talk about a spectrum. Uh, but otherwise, it's the same as the concept of a spectrum that you're used to, how the intensity varies with, with wavelength. And uh, I have here a graph of, uh, that's now a few months old uh, of theory and observation. Uh, I don't know how I can see them, but they're green data points here with error bars, and they're also red data points with error bars coming from two different observations. Uh, boomerang, the green points, uh, was a balloon experiment that flew at the South Pole, uh, orbited for about two weeks. When I say orbit, it made a big circle around the uh, vicinity of the South Pole and then came back. Uh, and the CBI, Cosmic Background Imager, whoops, uh, uh, get this right. Uh, CBI was a ground-based experiment, uh, but ground was very high ground. It's on top of a high mountain in Chile. Uh, and what's shown is the spectrum, where sh long wavelengths are to the left and short wavelengths are to the right. Uh, it's labeled what's called multiple number. Uh, that's just a spherical harmonic expansion, if you know about spherical harmonics. I imagine most of you probably do. If you don't, you can just think of this as a measure of the wavelength, uh, where the wavelength is equal to 180 degrees divided by L. So high L corresponds to short wavelength. It's all measured in angles. This we're just seeing an image on the sky. You don't know how far away it is. So it's angular wavelength that we're talking about. So anyway, what's shown here is the data, uh, which as you see is pretty complicated. It has a series of bumps and peaks. Um, and a theoretical curve based on the inflationary model, which fits the data pretty well, although the error bars are still quite large here. And for comparison, I've shown an open model, 
a model where omega is 0 0.3, which was very much the favorite model five years ago. Uh, and now we can see that it fits this data extraordinarily badly. So this open model is now considered to be completely ruled out. Now the data's gotten significantly better since this picture. Uh, the new ingredient is uh, a data set that was released just last month uh, by a satellite called WMAP, the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe. Uh, that's David Wilkinson, for whom it was just recently named. Uh, David Wilkinson was, was a great guy. He died about, I guess, a little more than a year ago now. Um, and he was one of the leaders of the project. In fact, has been one of the leaders in microwave background research since its very beginning. Uh, shown here is an artist's conception of the satellite itself uh, with the Earth and the Moon and the Sun behind it. Uh, this lineup shown here is accurate. Uh, this is a more detailed picture of the orbit that the satellite has. It's a very peculiar orbit. It, it lives at a place called L2, which is a Lagrange point, uh, a Lagrange point of the Earth-Sun system. And the Lagrange point means it's essentially a stationary point in the rotating frame following the Earth around the Sun. Uh, it's a very simple one. Uh, L2 just lives on a line uh, from the Sun to the Earth, and beyond the Earth is this point called L2. And the satellite really goes around with the Earth. Uh, person with the screen is going to the camera is going to hate me for this. Uh, but the satellite goes around with the Earth like this, always, always lying on the side of the Earth away from the Sun. And that's perfect for astronomical observations because it means that it can look outward and the sun, the earth, and the moon are at all times always behind it. Uh, and with those three objects in the sky, it's, if you're not in a place like that, uh, you know, one of them is almost always in the way. Uh, in this case, none of them are ever in the way. Uh, so it's the perfect place for astronomical observations. And it will soon become very crowded. There are a number of missions planned for L2. Uh, but this uh, MAP experiment was the first one to get there. The, I've shown here, let me skip this. It's interesting, but we're running out of time. Um, uh, this is the data. Uh, the same spectrum that I showed you before. It's on different, a different scale, so it doesn't look exactly the same. Uh, but it's basically the same picture that I showed you before, but this time with the data from the WMAP experiment, which is much, much more precise. So these little dots really do have error bars, even though you probably can't see them. Um, so the error bars are far smaller than what we had before, and it still fits the theoretical curve uh, essentially perfectly. Uh, it's rather miraculous that you can make predictions for such obscure things uh, and have them turn out to actually work. Okay, I want to say just, uh, I'm almost finished, but I guess, uh, this, yeah, this will be my last transparency since we're out of time. Uh, I have one other transparency. If you, I'll skip it. Um, what makes this notion that omega equals one suddenly the consensus while five years ago, nobody believed omega is equal to one except for true diehards who had faith in inflation. Uh, what, makes the, what makes the change is the discovery that today our universe is actually accelerating. Uh, and this evidence began in about 1998, uh, coming from the observations of two different astronomical teams uh, who observed uh, type 1a supernovae, using them as standard candles uh, to gauge what the expansion rate of the universe has been. Uh, because these type 1a supernovae could be seen at such distances, uh, they were able to essentially measure how the Hubble constant has evolved over the past five billion years. And the dis remarkable discovery was that the universe was not slowing down as we expected from ordinary gravity. Uh, but in fact, the universe today seems to be filled with this repulsive gravity, with some form of repulsive gravity material, uh, not, possibly not so different from what drove the inflation, although certainly at a much lower energy level. Uh, so today the universe is actually accelerating, we now believe. Uh, and the reason why that fits in so nicely with inflation is, first of all, it confirms the idea that gravity can act repulsively. Uh, but that was never really doubted by people who understood general relativity. Uh, the really important thing is that we can calculate how much mass density would be needed to cause the acceleration uh, that's being seen. And when we add that to the matter that we already knew was there, because we saw either the matter or its gravitational effects, uh, it adds up to almost exactly the critical density. Uh, I say here it's known to about 10% that it adds up right. Uh, this is an old transparency. Now with this WMAP data, uh, the number is uh, 1.02 plus or minus 0.02, which I just love. Um, so we really have now a very uh, consistent picture. Uh, I should add that it's a very peculiar picture. Uh, we have three totally different kinds of stuff filling our universe in our model now. There's the ordinary matter, the stuff that we're made of, which is about 4% of the total budget. Uh, there's what we call dark matter, which 
is matter that we've never seen. We don't know what it is, uh, but it's, it clusters in clusters of galaxies and in galaxies, and it's because of that clustering that we know it's there. We see its gravitational effects. Uh, and then there's the smooth background of matter that's causing the universe to accelerate, uh, and we have even less idea of, of what that is, although it could just be vacuum energy. But even if it is, we don't know why, why there is vacuum energy at, at anything like that energy level. Um, so the universe is made up of 96% uh, stuff that we don't understand at all. Uh, but nonetheless, we have a very consistent model. And even though we don't understand this stuff, we have a very detailed picture of how the stuff behaves. Uh, so we have a, a very successful model now, uh, now beginning to be called the standard model of cosmology. Um, but it's a model that certainly is built out of ingredients uh, that we know very, very little about. If you want to come back later, uh, we, if you ask me questions after the class ends, uh, I'll talk about how to create a universe in the laboratory. But meanwhile, I'll just to summarize. Um, what I tried to convince you today was that the Big Bang Theory is, is well supported by the evidence. There's the Hubble expansion, and the cosmic background radiation, the abundances of the light chemical elements. Um, but I pointed out that the classic form of the Big Bang Theory does not even attempt to explain the actual bang, uh, but inflation does. Uh, inflation offers a possible explanation of what started the universe expanding, and it can explain the origin, I usually say, of essentially all of the matter and energy in the universe. You have to start with the speck of this peculiar form of matter, uh, which, by the way, would weigh about a gram or so. Uh, so inflation is not a theory of the ultimate origin of the universe, uh, but it does take you from something very small to something that would be much, much bigger, in fact, than, than our visible universe. Um, the inflationary theory is supported by evidence in a number of ways. It can explain the uniformity that we see on large scales. It can explain, explain the nature of the cosmic background radiation non-uniformities, and it'll also explain why we're so close to the uh, critical mass density of the universe. And new observations, in particular new observations of the cosmic background radiation, observations of the supernova 1A, large-scale galaxy surveys also, although I didn't talk about this, uh, are making very important uh, new observations. And so far, they're all fitting in very nicely uh, with this theoretical framework that we have to describe the universe. Thank you. Okay, the question for the microphone is, is why, does, why does inflation drive omega towards 1? Uh, there is actually a, a very simple explanation in terms of geometry. Uh, general relativity ties geometry to the mass density, so it ties geometry to omega. Um, and what inflation does is it sim simply takes a, perhaps a piece of the universe, it doesn't have to be the whole universe, and stretches it by a fantastic factor. Uh, and just as the surface of the Earth looks flat to us, even though we know the Earth is really round, uh, really any curved surface, if it's not a fractal, if stretched enough, uh, will start to look smooth. Uh, so that's what inflation does. It takes a tiny speck of the universe that's so small that even if the universe is curved, that speck would not show that curvature, uh, and magnifies that speck to become large enough to be everything that we see, and therefore it essentially necessarily looks flat. And according to general relativity, if it's geometrically flat, uh, it is also at the critical mass density. Your original inflation was changed in various ways. Is there a way to talk qualitatively about that, or is it simply beyond that? No, I, I, I think I can, I can do that. Um, the Ed is right. The, the original version of inflation that I first proposed uh, did not work. Um, I was least aware of that at the time I published it, so that the paper has all the, quali all the necessary qualifications so that the paper isn't wrong, even though the theory is. Uh, <laughs> uh, it was later patched up by other people. The first working version of inflation was proposed uh, independently by Andre Lind in the Soviet Union and Albrecht and Steinhardt uh, in the US. Uh, the key has to do with the ending of inflation. Um, from the beginning, it was apparent that inflation had a wonderful mechanism for solving these cosmological problems. Uh, but you needed to end inflation in a way that, uh, that didn't mess up those solutions. Uh, inflation ends by uh, essentially a phase transition, uh, by the decay of this repulsive gravity material. And in my original proposal, that phase transition would have been a first-order phase transition, uh, very much like the way water boils. Uh, 
And I had in mind uh, that if things, if I was lucky, uh, the water would boil, forming a lot of little bubbles that would rapidly coalesce, forming a uniform steam and the uniformity could be maintained. Uh, but when I and others started doing more detailed calculations of how this would work, uh, we found that the, uh, the bubbles would not merge smoothly. And in fact, we were even, even able to show that the, the bubbles would never uh, undergo a process that we, that's called percolation. Um, percolation is, I guess, a word meant, made up by either the people who invented coffee or are condensed matter physicists. Uh, but in this, in this context, percolation means uh, forming an infinite cluster. So if you, when, the, when the first order phase transition happens, you have bubbles of the new phase forming. Uh, and roughly speaking, what happens is the bubbles just form a complicated, horrible, bubbly mess like, like violently boiling water. Uh, and the homogeneity never gets re regained. Uh, in detail, what we're able to show is that when the bubbles form, uh, as they're forming, the space is expanding around them. Uh, we showed that the bubbles would form finite clusters only, would never merge to fill the whole space. That's the absence of percolation. And furthermore, if you looked at any given cluster of bubbles, uh, it would really be dominated by whatever bubble formed first. And because that bubble has been expanding so rapidly, by the time the other bubbles form, they'll be very teeny compared to the first one. So each bubble universe would really look like a, a, a bubble sheet. And these bubbles, by the way, do have the characteristic of soap bubbles, that all the energy ends up in the, on the walls, really. Uh, so each bubble universe would really look like a sheet of matter uh, uh, with, with, with uh, complications on the surface of that sheet. But nonetheless, it would never uniformly fill a volume. Uh, so it ended up lo looking nothing like, a, like our universe. Uh, the problem was solved by uh, what's called the new inflationary universe. Uh, and the secret behind the new inflationary universe was to modify the dynamics of the proposed phase transition, uh, making it a, a very mild second order phase transition. Uh, so one often says that uh, the decay of this material is, is much more like the congealing of jello than the boiling of water. And that's what's needed to keep things smooth enough uh, so that at the end of inflation, you still have a uniform universe like inflation was able to achieve for you. No, no further questions. Let's thank Alan. Anyone want to stick around and find out how the universe is made in the laboratory? <laughs> <laughs> or anything else you want to know about inflation? <laughs>